PFAS have been on the news media for quite a while now. PFAS are contaminating the water supplies across the country. According to CDC's statistics, more than 98% of the U.S. population have detectable levels of PFAS in their blood. PFAS is the chemical of the day. This presentation will cover the background information of PFAS, what we know about them, what we need to learn about them, and how the public health community is responding to increasing concerns about exposures to PFAS. PFAS is short for per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances. I am Xin Yiling. I have been with the Office of Environmental Health for 15 years now. I will start with a bit of background to define PFAS and explain how PFAS have been used in the past and how exposures to PFAS have been occurred. PFAS is a family of man-made chemicals. PFAS are made up more than 5,000 different chemicals. They all have a carbon chain that either partially or fully fluorinated. So where there would be hydrogen atoms, instead you have fluorine atoms. Scientists sort PFAS into categories based on their slightly different structures. Some of these categories include PFAS and P4R and then fluoroterimer sulfonate and the genex. The carbon fluorine bond is one of the strongest in organic chemistry and is almost indestructible. That's how PFAS got the nickname forever chemicals. PFAS have many unique properties. They repel both water and oil, and they are particularly suited for use as dispersants and surfactants as well as in certain types of firefighting foam and some consumer products, such as non-stick cookware, food packaging, cosmetics, and water-resistant carpet and clothing. PFAS are also remarkably persistent in the environment and in people's body. Once PFAS are released in the environment, they don't break down or degrade and when people are exposed to them, they tend to stick around bound to proteins and circulating through the body. PFAS can be found near areas where they are manufactured or where products containing PFAS have been used. In these areas, PFAS are found in drinking water, in fish from contaminated surface water bodies, in soil, and even in dust. Ingestion from drinking water and food is the primary PFAS exposure pathway. PFAS exposure can also happen through the use of certain consumer products, things like stain-resistant carpets and some food packaging materials. There are also growing evidence that some food products may contain PFAS if they are grown or raised in areas with PFAS contamination. We also know that fetus and babies can be exposed to PFAS during pregnancy and through breastfeeding if the mother was previously exposed. The use of PFAS in the United States has a long history. PFAS were first synthesized in 1930. By the end of 1950s, large-scale production of PFAS was well underway. Around 1970, a few early studies reported PFAS detected in human blood samples. Manufacturers of PFAS peaked between 1970 and 2000. Somewhere in that time frame, toxicity studies began to suggest that PFAS may have the potential to cause adverse health effects in experimental animals. Manufacturers in the U.S. began to phase out PFOA and PFAS in 2000. Around the same time, CDC's survey results revealed that more than 98% of people tested had some PFAS in their blood, suggesting that exposures to these chemicals were widespread. Between 2013 and 2015, EPA conducted investigation to understand the U.S. population exposures to PFAS through drinking water. 65 out of 4,600 tested water systems had PFAS detections exceeded EPA's non-regulatory drinking water health advisory level of 70 ppt. 
However, there are still many water systems were not tested. These systems serve 60 million people. There are another 33 to 38 million people are on private wells, which were not included in this investigation. Recently, EPA released an action plan to address PFAS contamination in drinking water and protect public health. This data shows the PFAS in the blood of the U.S. population over time. CDC has measured PFAS in the blood of the U.S. population since 1999. This work has revealed that most people in the U.S. have PFAS in their blood, especially PFOA and PFAS. This work also shed light on exposure trends in the U.S. population. Since 2000, production and the use of PFAS and PFOA in the U.S. has declined. As the use of some PFAS declined, some PFAS blood levels have gone down as well. As we can see from the data that from 1999 to 2014, blood PFAS level declined by more than 80%. Blood PFOA level declined by more than 60%. However, two other species of PFAS, PFNA and the PFH excess, show less of a change over time. This could be due to greater persistence in the body and thus a slower response to changes in production and the use, or due to other factors that we are still in, uh, trying to figure out. Scientists do not fully understand the health effects that may be caused by PFAS. There are many different chemicals in the PFAS family, and not all PFAS have the same health effects. Although more research is needed, some studies suggest that exposure to high levels of certain PFAS may increase cholesterol level, reduce immune response, interfere with the body's hormones, lower a woman's chance of getting pregnant, affect the growth, learning, and the behavior of infants and older children, and increase the risk of kidney and testicular cancer. EPA's investigation results can be found at the ADHS's uh, Arizona Environmental Public Health Tracking Explorer. In this investigation, um, 74 public drinking water systems were investigated and three water systems had PFAS level exceeded EPA's uh, health advisory level in 2018. ADEQ conducted additional testing. The results showed that more than 94% of the tested water systems were either non-detect or below EPA's health advisory level. Public water systems with PFAS results higher than EPA's um, health advisory level are working with ADEQ to reduce exposures to customers. In Arizona, there are no known manufacturers of PFAS chemicals. Research also indicates PFAS compounds were not used on large-scale industry applications and tend to be localized. The ADEQ's investigation mentioned previously is part of the effort to understand the extent of PFAS contamination in the drinking water source. In Arizona, PFAS has already impacted and continues to threaten Tucson's drinking water supplies. Tucson Water has removed four drinking water production wells from service due to elevated PFAS levels. Additional drinking water production wells in Tucson Water's central well field are at risk um, from PFAS. These wells has the potential to provide water to over 600,000 people and is the only drinking water supply to the Central Arizona Project for Central Tucson. ADHS has worked with ADEQ, local and the federal agencies to address the PFAS threat to Tucson's drinking water supplies. ADEQ dedicated funds to delineate and capture PFAS contaminated groundwater from impacting additional drinking water production wells and is working with Tucson Water and the Air Force Civil Engineering Center. In addition, the work group notified private well owners in the area about the potential for PFAS impact. At the owner's request, the workforce um, tested 13 private wells 
for PFAS, and three of those wells showed elevated levels of PFAS. The work group worked with the Air National Guard to provide the residents with an alternate source of drinking water. ADHS developed health education materials about the potential health effects and the ways to reduce PFAS exposure from contaminated water. ADHS also worked with other agencies to conduct outreach activities. Here are some of the challenges that PFAS pose for impact communities and for public health researchers. There is a lot of concerns about PFAS exposure, but it is still growing as new communities are identified and new exposure pathways are uncovered. Only a small handful of PFAS have been studied well and new species are being developed to replace the others that are being phased out. We need more research on the health effects of these new compounds and a better analytical method to detect and measure human exposures. People are rarely just exposed to one or two species of PFAS. Scientists are still studying what the health effects of exposures to mixtures of PFAS. There is a big gap of our understanding. We also need better methods to treat PFAS contaminated drinking water. Some existing technology can be used to remove PFAS from water, but they are expensive and difficult to monitor. They may not remove all PFAS and they introduce the new problem of how to responsibly dispose the concentrated PFAS that are collected on the filter media. There are still so much that we don't know about PFAS exposure and the potential for adverse health effects. We don't know how to better help people who have been exposed and how to prevent future exposure. Thank you for your attention.